Hello, friends. This is Events the Misty Vibe brought to you by Three Fun Events, and I'm your host, Anka. Welcome to our 30th episode. And to celebrate in style, I've invited with me today a feature guest that knows how to party and have a good time, but more importantly, enable his audience to have a fantastic time as well. A native of Orange County, and you got to love that OC life. You still live there myself for a season, but recently relocated to Boise, Idaho, the president and founder of California Coast Auctions and co-founder of Idaho Benefit Events, Zach Crone has designed his business with one goal in mind, to unite the world of entertainment with the world of fundraising. With an experienced background in acting and event production, combined with over 15 years of experience in public speaking and coordination of television and feature film productions, whether you need an MC, a host, an auctioneer, an event coordinator, or a consultant, Zach can meet your event needs and exceed your goals. He has helped plan and execute live auctions, fundraisers, and social entertainment events for schools, churches, charities, and nonprofits all over the country, raising millions of dollars and breaking records after records. So just in 2019, I believe he's done an impressive 265 in-person events. I mean, how do you do that? Probably you're just going to work every single day of the year and with a few breaks. And in 2020, he's done 54 virtual events. Zach has this belief that the spirit and community and excitement of a live auction is the best way to raise money, awareness, and generate interest in an organization. He also believes that you have to give people a reason to walk through your doors or in a virtual format, stay glued to a screen. And the best way to do that is by entertaining and inspiring people in the process. You can imagine that Zach and I connected so well from the very first moment we started talking. I mean, say no more than production, fundraising, entertainment, and inspiration, and you've got me. So today, I have the honor of welcoming Zach to this ongoing virtual conversation related to virtual events and fundraising. That was quite an intro. <laughs> well, Zachary Crone, or should I call you Zach? <laughs> so Welcome. You, you and my mom, you can call me Zachary. <laughs> Mostly it's just Zach, though. You're funny. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call you Zach then. So good to have you here. Thank Great you for joining thank me. You. I'm, I'm blushing from that intro. That was, <laughs> That's mean, been so, good, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it like encapsulated my life in 30 to 50 seconds, you know, outside of marriage and children, but that's, that's well, lovely. I tried to do you justice. So hopefully, you know, it was, <laughs> it was good enough for all yeah. the stuff that you've done. Cause I can imagine there could be, you know, more things and chapters to add to that. Sure. We can brag about me as much as you want, I suppose. But hey, I'm sure not you're not going to mind it. <laughs> that's not why people are listening, but that's fine. <laughs> Okay, so to kick um, our conversation off today, I would love to hear from you what were some of the maybe wins, challenges, the lessons learned in 2020 after all of those 50-something virtual events that you've done? Oh, the wins. Okay, well, the wins were the fact that right after the pandemic hit, people were calling me to either just postpone, but they were also like, what do we do? We can't postpone. It's too close. And, you know, they didn't want to refund their sponsorship monies or refund their tickets. And so I said, let's go virtual. And I was predicting that virtual events were going to kind of come into the fray in like three to five years anyway, because of international or bi-coastal, you know, donor bases. So I knew that it was on the precipice. So COVID just kind of thrusted it in. And I was already thinking about how to make these a worthwhile events. And what we learned very, very quickly was that you cannot put a gala on screen the means by which people consume these events are so much differently and you lose the value proposition of a live event, you know, the party, the drinks, the dress up, the, the live entertainment, and you have to supplant that value proposition with what you put on screen. Otherwise people aren't going to be drawn in to watch. They'll be somewhat obligated uh, because they're yeah. you know, members of the community, but that's not, that's not how you thank a donor base. That's not how you attract new donors. And so we learned as we kept doing them, that we're putting on a television show. 
and we are balancing the value proposition between entertainment for the crowd and fundraising for the nonprofit. And by having that kind of constant volley and back and forth while at the same mm -hmm. time, you know, keeping the auction and fundraising portion entertaining and worth watching as well, because that's the last part you, you know, you need that part to be captivating or interesting as well. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as we started chiseling away, we found ways to make it tighter and, and more thought provoking and where sponsorship packages could be designed and kind of just learned the routine of these now and what works and what doesn't and trying to everyone's a first timer now. There's no preconceived notion. So there's a lot more energy that goes into the pre-production. I'm on the phone a lot more on Zoom, yeah. a lot more with the clients in pre-production, walking them through this process. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting more and more involved uh, with the with the show, with the production, with the ideas, yeah. and how to execute them, probably the same way you are. Yeah. So the wins are is that we figured it out and we figured it out quickly and realized that you know, I almost don't even like the word auctioneer anymore. It really isn't <laughs> that applicable to what I do. And yes, I can It's true. Do it. It's true. So it's, why would you call yourself now in this I mean, world? Auction of tainer, auction auction tainer, tainer. <laughs> host, whatever. I mean, I've always, I, I've kind of, corn, you know, I've, I've made a living by being, I guess, more entertaining than the average commercial auctioneer because the auction chant plays no role in this. My, yeah. my style of conducting a live event was always much more improvisational, and, you know, definitely still moving the money along and using, you know, the education and experience I've had for real estate and car auctions and all that stuff and applying it to the auction process. But that's only one small part of it. This is virtual yeah, events yeah. is much more host based, much more comedic based. You have to produce something that's going to be interesting. And the best way to do that on screen is to surprise them. You surprise and a joke is a surprise. You, you say one thing and then you surprise them with the punchline. And, you know, a fund to need speech used to be very brief, it used to be like one little page. It was, you know, you tee it off and then you read off the numbers and you maintain momentum and energy and it grows and it's always about energy and it's still about energy on the screen, but it's also about, there's a motivational speaking aspect to it because you're, you're, you're shouting out their names and it's a balance between the donations that come in and the names you read off. And I like making it interpersonal. That's another win of the virtual event. You are, you're not just acknowledging a bid number, you're acknowledging a person by name yeah. on screen. And there's a jumbotron like effect to that. And the biggest win of all is that they're cheaper. They're a, a, a fraction of what a live event costs. So we're seeing events raise just as much and more. I've never had an event raise less than it did at a live event in 2019, which says a lot about the format. It says a lot about, you know, the production value we're throwing on and the promotional aspect behind it and, and uh, how to survive. In, yeah. yeah in post COVID era fundraising. I couldn't agree more with you. And I think people really need to hear that coming from a auction tier that has done so many virtual events in 2020, because every so often I would be talking with a nonprofit and the first response is, well, I don't think we can raise any money with virtual events. And that couldn't be farther away from the truth because the case studies that we bring to the table and the experience that we've had in the virtual fundraising world of events is actually the opposite of what yeah. somebody that hasn't done it uh, has this you know, opinion of what a virtual event could be or fundraiser. The truth is it does require more work. And I mean, like you said, I spend more time on pre-event planning and production planning than on any of the in-person events I've done before. And uh, while before I was able to run through a lot of events because it was kind of following the same timeline, now I feel like I have to educate much more right. than I used to have to do. Because a lot of people, they were just relying on the production house. They were relying on the production AV people or event producer to do their thing. You know, they didn't have to be that involved. They didn't have to actually take care of the technology on there. And especially if you are a virtual MC or a virtual speaker, Speaker that will partake in the event from your home office, basically. Now mm -hmm. you have to have that production 
right on your end uh, and uh, we were talking about that because you have a little studio in your garage that if mm -hmm. you're not going in a studio you can totally just set it up and be ready to go but that's not something that everybody has right that it, it right. took some thought and because you have the production background probably was something like oh yeah no brainer of course i need a good microphone i need good lighting i need a good camera I never thought I'd be using my college degree so uh, eagerly and happily. You know, I majored, <laughs> 2020. In <laughs> majored in television and film, so I was really happy in a way that I had the background knowledge to use the, this technology in my own garage. And yes, I do have a green screen, so no one wants to see the inside of my garage. <laughs> yeah, It's quite an interesting, I mean, there is an educational process. The good news is, is that 2021, those who established it, and mm -hmm. realize that this method of fundraising isn't going anywhere. Even yeah. when live events come back, there's still going to be a hybrid element. There's still going to be a streamed element. And it's like people are thinking about virtual versus live in a very binary fashion. And that's a mistake. You wouldn't think golf tournament versus gala, one or the other. You do both in different yeah. seasons. Well, congratulations. <laughs> By establishing yourself with a new revenue stream in the virtual medium, you are creating a whole new donor base with a much broader radius and footprint yep. of who you can reach. You are the castle walls are low because you know we'll talk about ticket pricing and access to the event, but generally it's a lot cheaper than a hundred and fifty dollar ticket to attend a live event. So you're welcoming in the millennials and making a more egalitarian, you know, fundraiser that's based off of equity and that everyone is capable and willing, regardless of age, health disposition. Or, or general income, we want to welcome in more people. It would be silly not to. The So you, you're going to do your live event again, eventually, I'm sure, but you should establish yourself now with this virtual revenue stream because it's how people are becoming introduced to you yeah. in a lot of ways. It's not the same old board members and the same old sponsors and same old friends. You are growing as, by virtue of growing your fundraising net and quite frankly, you re, you kind of have a responsibility to do so as a nonprofit. The goal of any fundraiser or any business is to appeal to human nature. Yeah. And there's two sides to human nature when it comes to fundraising right now. You have the desire to party and congregate and get dressed up and eat a nice meal and mm -hmm. talk to your friends and be a pillar of society as a social debutante while giving and letting other people see you give. And then you have the other side, the pajama side the couch, the food getting <laughs> delivered for you, the comfortable, the safe, the means of consuming entertainment in such a way. And so you'd be silly to totally turn your back on an entire realm of human conditions. So accept yeah. it. And it is profitable. Like you were saying earlier, it's profitable because for, I think for two reasons, one, empathy for causes has never been higher because the need for the causes has never been higher. It would be like not doing a virtual event is almost like the red cross, not asking for money after a hurricane. Yeah. Everyone has been affected by COVID no matter what nonprofit or school, there's money that needs to be raised to keep your program going and keep your doors open, but also pivot and adjust so that's that's one area of why this is successful. The other one is because it's welcoming in a whole new donor base. They're cheaper, as mm -hmm. I said before. And when you get the right people who are involved, like yourself, who know how to put on a good production and understand that it is it it is about putting on a quality show, yeah, more so than a quality night. It's a little yeah. different that way. And then, of course, how do you make it special? And that's what we're seeing in 2021. People who established this revenue stream and this donor base are now upping their game. Exactly. And, and expanding their capabilities in the virtual realm, which is which is great. The Absolutely. point is to adapt or die. The world has changed. Therefore, the tools of success have for, for success have changed as well. So yeah. you must adapt. And you can't just keep waiting for, for it to go. Rarely in the history of human existence have things gone in reverse exactly so the landscape has changed forever you have to change with the times to a certain extent absolutely gone are the days when because you just actually landed from oc last night into boise remember the days when we didn't have to have the security check lines we're well, not going back i still am flying um and i'll tell you the airports have never been better i was curious about that like totally like streaming off from our conversation but i was just curious because i haven't been actually flying or in an airport in one year right now it's been a year can you believe that and that i used to fly crazy. every weekend 
Yeah, I, I am still flying every weekend. I am still the primary auctioneer, one of the primary auctioneers mm -hmm. for Julian's Auctions House. Which I is, see. Which is a auction firm right on Cannon Drive in downtown Beverly Hills. And we're right next to the Palm and Spagos and all that kind of stuff. So they still fly me in because it's they're still doing live events. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's honestly my background in working with an auction house makes it so much easier to translate into doing this virtual thing because when you do an auction house event you're on camera you have to be camera conscious you can't just run around like you do at a benefit <laughs> you are taking bids from two different bidding platforms yeah you are taking bids from three to five different phone bidders and you're going to have a, a smattering of people in the room so it already hybrid events have been around for a long long time they just haven't found their way into the nonprofit auction world yet and so maybe that's something we're talking about because people constantly yes. ask me, you know, should we do a hybrid event? And I always say, yes, you have to, it's like providing a handicap spot. You have to provide that because there are people who aren't going to come to a live event. They're not going to feel safe yet. Um, but yeah. when live events do come back, you're going to see a lot more outdoors. You're going to see a lot more daytime. You're going to see a lot more two top and four top tables where people are properly distanced from each other. Yes. You're going to see a lot more drive-in events, which I'm already seeing, which are a lot of fun. Yes. Yes. But you're also going to see that roving camera crew with a steady cam following you around. I mm -hmm. don't recommend just setting up a camera in the back of the room and streaming it. No one likes to no, watch No. Actually, that's exactly the type of conversation I'm having right now with a client for this hybrid event that I'm doing in June. And it's going to be, like you mentioned, you know, it's an outdoors venue. We have, you know, a little indoor for a VIP um, area. And then we have an outdoor stand and it's all social distance and all of that. I mean, this is Oregon, so they're even more strict than what we are here. And we're talking about that setup where, okay, before, sure, we had iMag in the back of the room, but now we have to think about the quality of the live stream of the virtual right. event. So you can't really do that with the zoom in, zoom out type of no. camera. You know, you, you are... really have to have a place right there next to the stage for another camera angle, for that preview monitor, for being able for the auctioneer to receive the online bid. Like yeah. you said, like multitasking on a completely different level sure. if you're that auctioneer, because now you have to be able to pay attention to all those things coming at you. You, you see that during a live event, you would almost wish you had a fish eye lens because you have, you know, a room full of people raising their bid cards and you have to look over here and still see what's going on over there. So now it's like you have your camera or t and maybe teleprompter. You have your confidence monitor, which shows you the bidding activity yeah. and you have sometimes your stream monitor. So you know what the crowd's using. Yep. So you're talking about the same thing that they're seeing. You almost want your hybrid event to have the capability as where someone could watch it using a virtual reality headset, like a VR. So I did one where a camera crew of two, pe of two people were following mm -hmm. me. And you want people to feel like, even though they're watching virtually, yeah, you want they're to part feel of like the they event. are there in the, in the ballroom yes. at their own table. And they can their eyes are just simply being supplanted. Now, here's the yeah. key that we have to be careful yeah. of as event producers, as nonprofits in general. If you're going to do a hybrid event, you cannot run the risk of devaluing your live event. I've seen it happen in mm. the real estate auction world, the car auction world, and and on the auction house world. You're charging $150 a ticket or more to attend your live event. And now, and it's not like everyone attends out of a desire to go. Some people do attend out of obligation. Some people do attend because U.S. Bank is who they work for and U.S. Bank bought a table and you have to go. Right. But now you can say, hey, you can come to the event virtually. And they'll say yes, especially if it saves them money. So you have to be very careful when offering what is the value proposition of the live event versus the value proposition of the hybrid event. Obviously, the live event has to be more. But if you say this is 150 and this is free, what's the consumer going to choose? So what do we do then? Do we charge them to attend the virtual event? Possibly. Do we deliver mm -hmm. food to them so we're still mm -hmm. justifying the cause? Because if you're charging a ticket, you have to be offering something in return. What do, and right. unless you have really big headline entertainment, yeah. it's hard to justify a ticket sale. Some some auctioneers, you know, it depends on the event. If if your event is a small school, make it free yeah. and then price tier it out based off of what they can pick up, what they can deliver. You can order flowers, you can order exactly you know, raffle tickets and pictures. Party in a box, whatever. And, and the food yeah. and the booze and all that kind of stuff. You would price tier that. But mm -hmm. just to watch the virtual event for a pure virtual event should be free. But for a hybrid, you don't want to lose half of your live audience because now you've provided them with an avenue not to attend. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to be very, very cautious. It's a very case by case basis. It's a very tricky time mm -hmm. for the benefit auction world because you don't want to see what has happened. We don't want that to happen for live events. That what has happened at the car auctions and what's happened at the auction houses where they go, why go when I can just bid online? Well, probably all the outgoing people like myself will totally go because, I mean, we can't wait to get out of the house and right. go to a party, <laughs> uh, dress up and all that. But most of the, the remaining uh, audience there's, will be like, a 50 /50. eh, it's comfortable to right. be, you know, joining from home. So I guess segueing into the next question is what do you say would be then best practices as you're planning your virtual or hybrid fundraising event uh, so that you can guarantee a successful event? Well, first of all, it comes down to promotion. You have to really get the word out now. You do have to reach out to social media, maybe pay for a social media ad campaign. And that becomes a major, major uh, new player in it, which a lot of mm -hmm. nonprofits, they may not even have had a YouTube channel. They may not have even had a Facebook or Instagram page, but you really have to step up that social media game because this is a millennial based platform and it, that's how you do it. I, I find that the more viewers you have, the more money you make. That's yeah. That's what I've seen. So, so getting how, eyes on the screen, so it's getting eyes still... on the screen plays a big role. So yeah, there's a handful of ways to go about that. It's it's very very important to incentivize your crowd in three ways. One, you need to incentivize them to register. Simply for registering, you're automatically entered in to win something or be yeah. involved or get something in return. You need to incentivize them to give donations that have occurred during COVID have been more transactional in nature. There's less just giving from the heart and more giving because what I can get back. So for every hundred dollars you donate, you might be automatically entered in to win something. Um, and then the incentive to stay. Now, what is that? The watch entail? to win type of prices. The watch to win. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to incentivize someone to watch. It could be a celebrity that you've hired and you've mm -hmm. paid five grand for, and you're gonna and they're gonna share it on their Instagram feed that has 170,000 followers, and you're gonna get more people watching because of their performance base. Yeah, I did an event with Sammy Hagar. People logged on to see Sammy Hagar make a drink and play guitar. I did an event with Justin Willman, very talented magician, has his own show on Netflix. Mm -hmm. The dude solved a Rubik's cube in his mouth. <laughs> How does one do that? I, have no I idea. think I actually have seen him uh, at a virtual conference uh, yeah. on some platform. It talented. was like. Crazy. I mean, a little slobbery, yeah. but it's like still. <laughs> talented, talented fella. And the other method of entertainment, you're either hiring extraordinary people with extraordinary talents and putting them on screen and letting them do their thing, or you're taking ordinary people and putting them in an extraordinary situation. And it's good to do something entertainment-based that might be contest-based. Because once you get invested in a contest, you want to see who wins. So you're going to watch the whole thing. For example, yeah. I did an event for a hospital down in um, Southern California. And we took three professional surgeons, like an orthopedic surgeon, a cardiologist, and a, I think a gastrointestinal specialist. And we played a competitive game of operation, <laughs> the board game. And okay, so it wasn't like they're going to operate on so, a real person right no, now in front no, of you. That would be gross. Um, <laughs> I know. But these doctors, they had a following. Mm -hmm. They have you know people in their department rooting for them. We made it interactive so you could donate on behalf of whichever doctor you think was going to win. And if your doctor does win, you're entered into a raffle. So we did Kids Club Jeopardy and Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? There's like, you know, pick your school and you're going to do XYZ Schools Got Talent. So it's videos that kids can submit and they can be raising money for the classroom that they're in. So you can have one representative from each class and any kids that submitted videos that didn't make the actual program are going to be in the prologue or after the yeah. end of credits or something like that. So they all get their moment in the sun. So getting a talent show together is how you're definitely going to get parents to watch. We did that. We knew that from live events that that doesn't really yeah, change. Exactly. I think the one I'm doing this weekend has a teacher pie eating contest or something like that. I loved working with this um, senior living facility and we played the newlywed game, which, you know, is where you ask questions about how well you know your spouse. And these people have been married <laughs> for 40 to 50 years. And I'd be asking Harold, what is Margaret's favorite food? And he'd be like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was all grumpy and it made, it made for good entertainment because That's it awesome. was interesting. And then the auction items kind of served as the commercials in between yeah. the entertainment segment. So it yeah. was a balance. When you look at a TV show, your average TV show has 70% content, 30% advertising. When you look at like what Jerry Lewis would do, which was a telethon, it was 50-50. It was 50% fundraising, 50% entertainment. And that's usually the modality that we apply here. So find your method of entertainment 
And that's the key to success, whether it's a variety show, a game show. I played, I did an LGBT group and they played the dating game. It was mm-hmm. the first ever LGBT dating game. Bachelor number one, bachelor number two, bachelor number three. Yeah. And then the person asking the questions was also a bachelor. So that was almost groundbreaking in a way. Yeah. Um, and as the auctioneer, I am the arbiter of truth and balance and, and, um, I'm your one part game show host, one part host, one part auctioneer, and then one part motivational speaker. And much like how to keep content interesting when doing a fund to need is all about motivational speaking now and the greater cause of giving and setting up a motivational speech is a lot like setting up a joke. You introduce the premise and then you surprise them with the response. How surprising is it to say to an audience during a fundraiser to say, I don't want you to think about a donation. Donations aren't what matters. What matters is your decision. Mm. And your decision in this case equals destiny for the people that are depending upon your participation tonight. Saying things like that kind of, you know, gird people up into feeling compelled to give. You go Tony Robbins on them, Zach. Exactly. (laughs) You do. You really do tap into the greater human psyche of giving because the visceral aspect of giving, the live aspect of giving, the peer pressure aspect of it is a little diluted. It's still present because their name appears on the screen and you don't want to be the only name not on that screen. Yeah. But when you're at a table and you see someone sitting across from you, you and they're going to give 500, even though you were planning to only give 250, you're going to raise your bid card at 500. That's just human nature. So you have to appeal to, the, again, the other side of human nature, which is making every moment meaningful. Mm. And so if you make your event interesting, entertaining, and meaningful, people will appreciate the show and the value. And then the other aspect of this that we haven't even touched on is production value. Yeah. People don't like the Zoom fundraiser. Before we move any further, I wanted to give a quick shout out to our main sponsor, Trifan Events, which is a boutique event planning and production agency that will come alongside you, offering personalized event planning and technical support, strategic event design, production and technology management, and flawless execution for live, virtual, and hybrid events. The team at Trifan Events is passionate about planning and producing event experiences that get people involved with true moments of interaction, engagement, and co-creation while offering white glove treatment throughout the entire planning process, enabling you to reach your event goals with the use of creativity, production tools, and event technology. To find out how Trifun Events can plan and produce your event become memorable, go to trifunevents.com. Has a story. And it's entranced and it has good production value and it's actors who probably look better than your average, you know, (laughs) you'll be, I'd be lying to myself if I didn't say that looks played a role in who goes on screen and why, but you do want to suspend disbelief. And and because a zoom meeting is not entertaining, a zoom meeting is very logistical. It's very bland. It's very boring. The same reason you put all these wonderful graphics up over this conversation. Yeah. Otherwise, we would just look like a Zoom meeting. So here's something that I wanted to go into just talking about this production value that you mentioned to add to an event, a virtual event, a hybrid event. How do you see that done in a successful way where we elevate even more so that production value and especially as it will translate into hybrid events? Well, you bring up something that it's kind of like near and dear to my heart. I remember around... February, March of 2020, before the pandemic hit, I was talking to another event producer in Southern California and they're like, Zach, we're tired of this format. We're tired of this run of show, the, mm-hmm. you know, the pre-party, the sit down, the first course, the welcome, the main course, the auction, the, the heart tugging moment, then the fun to need, and then the DJ. That was kind of your standard run of show. The standard run of show on a virtual event is much more oscillating. It's back and forth. It's intersplicing things together. It's most of these virtual events tend to be about 45 minutes in length. Mm-hmm. So you have to think about it that you're producing three 15 minute segments that each have something fundraiser based, entertainment based, and maybe, you know, everybody kind of wants their pound of flesh. So there's always going to be a chair or a, an executive director or somebody who wants to come up and say something. Mm-hmm. So you have to constantly balance that because the way people consume these events is a little bit like in some ways, the way you might consume the news or sports center, your mm-hmm. ears are going to perk up when you hear or see something you like. 
and you're and you might not be as attentive with something that you're not interested in. Mm-hmm. So again, always make it interesting. So what I'm excited about is how the run of show in the virtual event is then going to cross back over and correct the run of show and offer something new in the live event format. I want to see a live event format become much more oscillating to keep people engaged. If you do seven auction items in a row, not everyone is watching all seven items intently. They might watch one or two, but it's Mm going to be boring for eight tenths of that. So to go back and forth, to be like auction item entertainment, auction item entertainment, auction item entertainment, maybe more than one fund to need. It's all changing. It's all very evolutionary and it's all very exciting. So the run of show is definitely should and needs to change for a live event if you're doing a hybrid element. And, yes. and honestly, a lot of it comes down to who is is content, who you are putting on screen. People ask me, Zach, is this is it going to be better to put this video first or this video second when I haven't seen the video? I was like, I don't know. It's <laughs> on content. Let me see it. Exactly. And a lot of it is pre-produced too. The only thing that really has to be live is the fundraising element. Everything else can be pre-recorded. So I'm I'm doing voiceovers. I'm doing pre-recording sessions. I'm being hired for a fundraiser, not an event. I might have three camera recording, you know, in studio sessions. Mm -hmm. Um, It really just depends on how they choose to produce the event. It's exciting to do it live. But the key is my job has expanded greatly. And luckily I kind of had those skills in my back pocket already. This is not a job for the auctioneer. This is not a commercial auctioneer's job anymore. The chant plays very little role. It's all about improv. It's all about being able to reach through that camera and communicate with people on an interpersonal level and Mm -hmm. keep them interested in what you're going to say next. There should never be a pause. There should never be dead air. This is a much tighter show. A live event, you're just going to have like segments and you you don't know what that person's going to say necessarily or how long they're going to take. This is scripted. This is detailed. You are much more in control of the content that you are producing. No one's going to take your event hostage for their own personal needs or gains. No, there's no, <laughs> no red herring anymore. So that's a big plus side on this. Yeah. You are in charge completely and utterly, which should let you breathe easier. And once you kind of get educated on what's necessary, there's only three main vendors, maybe four. So you said, you know, that these are harder. They're only harder because they're new. Once you understand them, they're very, very easy because there's less moving parts. It's yeah. It's scripted and it's scheduled and it's not done all at once. The deck has been spread out. It's going to have little pieces that are then going to conjoin on the broadcast date. Absolutely. So as we're looking at this fundraising event, we both agree, you know, that it's quite important to invest into this auction tier personality MC that will be able to maximize the amount you raise and give your guest a top-notch experience, regardless if they're in person or watching online. And for that, technology is an obvious ingredient for success. But what I'm curious to find out from you is what were some of the items that have performed the best in a, you know, virtual fundraising event in the past sure. year. You know, it was interesting. I was talking to Tim Rogers, who is a brother of a very good friend of mine, and he's the manager of Newport Beach Ferrari. Mm-hmm. He sold more Ferraris in the first half of 2020 than they did in all of 2019, because driving is all you really could do at the time. So if the world comes at an end, at least I'm going to get my Ferrari and go for a nice ride on PCH. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) People want to experience freedom any way they can. That's a natural human instinct, especially now. So the drivable distanced vacation is the type of thing that's selling selling really well. Can't really do concerts or sports. That's not going to have a a marketplace, uh, at least for a, a, a while until... You know, things come back in Idaho and things come back in, in different markets. Yeah. The, the cabin, the socially distance in style, that's what sells well. The cabin, the, you know, the skiing, the mountains, the rivers, the lakes, the whitewater rafting, the physical recreational experiences are going to sell just fine. So whether it's a, a cabin, a, hunt, a, a wine cottage, a houseboat, an RV rental, uh, a kind of a staycation package mm-hmm. would include like a fancy car for the weekend with a dinner. Um, so I'm seeing a lot more home improvement entities, which is interesting yeah. video game cabinets, mm. ping pong, basically anything that can make you a drunk, a hunk or a chunk is what's going to sell just fine. 
So if people come together and make food packages, if you consort a whole bunch of wine and make the instant wine cellar, mm -hmm. you know, during COVID, your drinking name, your COVID-19 drinking name is your first name followed oh by gosh. your last name. So, um, Riesling Anka to the stage. <laughs> yep. That'd be funny. Zach Pino. Um, there's, That's hilarious. But yeah, a lot of instant bar carts, a lot of things of that nature because we still consume certain aspects of it. I'm seeing home theater systems, you mm -hmm. know, houses, gardens, you know, contractor builds and stuff like that. A lot more technology, um, all the electronics to get you yeah. set up with your new home zoom studio office is, is even an item. I'm a big fan of the support your local small business package Yeah, where you can get 10 people to underwrite the purchase of 10 $100 gift cards to local merchants because it's mm -hmm. the small businesses that are supporting the nonprofit. So you want the nonprofit to reciprocate and support the small business. Cause you know how it is. You get a $100 gift card. You're going to go in there and spend 130. Yeah, and exactly. If not more, if not more. So, you know, the, everything, the local hardware store, the local restaurants, they all need us right now. And that's how yeah. the only way we're going to get through this as a community is together. And I think nonprofits are smart enough to realize that without you, the, you know, the donor, there is no us. Yeah. And the donors are usually small business owners. Yeah. So it's not Amazon that's donating to your nonprofit. It's, it's the local store. Who's Although they should, based on how much we all went to, you know, Amazon prime during All COVID. Other conversation. Totally other conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about those sponsorship opportunities uh, then for any of the maybe local businesses or any of the sponsor uh, exposure moments that can be created during a virtual or a hybrid event. Because if there is something that sometimes gets a little either ignored or not, there's not as much ROI as you would want to is in those opportunities for, for virtual events when it comes to sponsors and exposure. I don't know if I told you this, but I was a development director for about a year. Mm -hmm. And in learning the other side of the nonprofit fundraising world. Priceless. My, it, exactly. So I, I definitely gained the perspective of what it means to sit in that chair. And I was the closer. I was the guy who was brought in to go to lunch, to go to coffee and sit down and find out how much this person could give and how much they wanted. So you really, based off of the sponsor and the individual, it's really about finding what they want and you have to have something to sell them. So whoever you call, if you're calling a business owner or an individual or a board member or whatever, say, can always start with this line. Can we talk? Can we meet for coffee? Can we schedule a Zoom call? I really need your advice. I really could use your opinion on this. Mm -hmm. And that's the first rule of development work. Never ask for money because if you ask for money, you're only going to get advice. But if you ask for advice, you mm -hmm. might get money. So I would say, I need your advice. Can we meet? And then I would say, you know, I, you small talk as you're drinking your iced tea and you say, well, what is it about this organization that brought you together in the first place? And then I'd sit back and I'd let them talk. I'd pretty much put them on my psychiatrist chair and they would share their personal connection. They would share, you know, who introduced them to it in their social circle, mm -hmm. why it came to be that you were even on my list. All the while, by doing so, by sharing with you their connection, they're talking themselves into why they should be supporting you. Exactly. And so you need to come armed then with your ideas. And you need to say, okay, I needed to meet with you because I need your idea. I need your opinion on this. These are, we're doing a virtual event. And these are the ideas that I have that I can build as a sponsorship packet to mm -hmm. offer someone who is willing to donate. So for instance, if someone were to donate $10,000 to us, we could produce them a 30 second commercial, which then they could repurpose and reuse in other broadcast means. We can put their logo in the watermark, just like we have here. We can have it in the middle of the show, the beginning of the show, the end of the show. We can deliver dinner to their home and wine to their home. We can give them all the flowers and the, you know, the glass stemware that you're creating for it, whatever trinkets or, you mm -hmm. know, nominal items. Some people are even using items themselves that they've gotten donated or consignment items. If you donate $10,000 to us, we'll give you this trip to Mexico. It doesn't expire until the end of 2022 or the end of 2023. And sometimes that may be cost you a thousand dollars, but it got you a $10,000 donation. So that's a net of 9,000. Why yeah. not? 
what do you think? Does that sound like enough to attract a donor? Mm -hmm. Not you, but a donor. Right. And their opinion, their answer to that is going to be very insightful to you as a development person, as a, someone who's trying to procure, as to where their head's at. They might actually have some good ideas, but as a, each sponsor is different. They have different business models. They have different needs. Yeah. Some might need more help in social media. And so maybe we can help you, you know, we can trade services and barter that. And we can use our social media person to come over and bo boost your social media game. You might need, they might need more exposure from an advertising standpoint. They might want, they might have that itch to scratch when it comes to being on screen. Um, what do you want? What do you want out of this? Because I want it to be equitable. I want it to be fair. I want to justify the donation. And, you know, then if they kind of say, well, that's that's uh, $10,000, that's a lot of money or whatever, mm -hmm. say, well, 5000 gets you this. And then you can start going into your procurement. Well, you know, um, we're still looking for a cabin. We're still looking for a houseboat, an RV, a lake experience, a whitewater rafting experience. Do you know anyone? Who do you know that you can put us in touch with that would constitute a live auction worthy item? Hey, you got a great wine seller, you want to give us a couple of cases, we can say that you sponsored this item. And that's how silent auctions are born, right? Yep. A silent auction is the procuring a silent auction item should be the result of being told no five times. <laughs> because if you're starting at 10,000, getting a $100 donation should be easy, because yeah. you've given yourself somewhere to go in this negotiation process. Never walk into a place asking for a silent auction item. You're shooting, you're aiming too low, aim yeah. higher than that. And then end at the silent auction. And exactly. if they still say no to that, we could still use you as a volunteer. We can put you to work. Your time is just as valuable as your money, things of that nature. Exactly. Like, like right there, this just paid off for this episode. We need to put a price on this, Zach. We've got to sell it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, believe me, I probably could have sold skyscrapers and commercial real estate auctions and retired by now, but I chose to do this. And, that was just one technique. That was yeah. just one theory of how to approach a sponsor, underwriter, or auction donor. Mm -hmm. I like to ask them for everything. And I like to have conversations with people because being a development director is about relationships. Being my position, I'm not a vendor. I'm not a DJ. I'm not a magician. I'm the auxiliary committee member. I'm the person who can say things to the board that you might, as a development director or executive director, may not be able to say because I'm a third party, you know, and me saying it's not going to risk your job. So yeah. there's freedom in, in me being able to say things. So I'd be silly not to share them. And yeah. um, that's why I'm, I shared it with you on the show. Yeah. Because I want people to use that for the greater success of humankind and the community. So by all means, take it and run with it and yeah. know that when I'm brought into an event, 90% of the work is the consulting. It's yeah. the it's the walking you through this process. I have been doing it for a while now, and I'm very proud of how many virtual events that I've done. And it's taught me a lot. And it's it's still really. I'm sure you find this. Let me know. Do you find this? You've done a ton of virtual events, and isn't it still hilarious how sometimes people fight you on best practices? Oh, Never absolutely. Has it been more lopsided for you exactly. to know more than the than the client? Yeah. Which is so interesting because, again, the same way where you wanted to get the other perspective on what it's like to plan an event, the reason why um, I wanted to go and get my CMP, you know, which is Certified Meaning Professional Accreditation, is because I wanted to walk in their shoes for a while so I can gain that experience and that perspective, even though that was never going to be my goal in becoming a event planner, development director, like what I do, I love to do. And going back to what you mentioned, you know, if we wanted to get rich in this business, we would be selling, I don't know, medical devices during a pandemic. That would have actually made me some money in 2020, we right? Been, we would have been plenty rich. We are in the nonprofit business. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so sad. But it's because of the heart, the passion for all right. those events and how we can help and support them. So while we're at this place of like spilling out all the secrets, can you also share from your wealth of experience, you know, acting and in the entertainment experience that you have, what are some of your secrets to techniques that you use to keep an online audience entertained during a virtual event? You know, by virtue of having done so many live 
fundraiser events and theater, you, you get pretty trained in improv. A lot of auctioneers attempt improv and wind up kind of missing the mark, either from a humor standpoint, or it comes off as like rude or mean or not mm -hmm. that interesting. So many jobs because the auctioneer last year just said the wrong thing, thinking that yeah. they were funny, but they were brash and rude and not equipped. And the camera is so much more of a microscope. Plus you put it out there. You can't really take it back if yeah. it's being recorded and posted In on so event, many it's platforms. Humor. It's safe jokes. It's humor. You're you're kind of using the Bob Hope method of a, of a, of applicable humor, and it's about asking questions and asking the right questions and using you know the, the nature of being a fundraiser for a virtual or a live event is taking the ego and turning it upside down. Uh, and putting it on its head and using it as your tool to get people to give. So, you know, if I'm in the middle of doing an auction item, I'm not just going to say, you know, it's not a chant, first of all. Okay, we're doing this trip to Y, 500, and who's going to do a bid of 750? You don't know what's going to happen. That's a big part of it. Yeah. So if I'm selling a, a trip, you know, this is a wonderful five day and four nights day for you and your loved ones and your two favorite children to have an incredible time where you're going to enjoy all the wonderful fishing, swimming, hiking, biking, tennis, surfing, golfing, shopping, sailing, dining, drinking, snorkel, scuba, laughing, kissing, hugging, dancing, prancing, and romancing to enjoy everything from the pool, the spa, the cougars at the bar, and the divorcees in the restaurant. Make sure you have a wonderful time because this is a lot cheaper than and alimony, so place your bids now. The lat, if you don't bid, we're going to send you to Fresno, California, where they only have Arby's and Chevron all in the <laughs> same place. So hurry up and place your bids so you can sit in the lap of luxury. You know, why is it always the lap of luxury? Don't you want to get to know luxury first? Put your arm around luxury, take luxury out for coffee, meet luxury's parents before hopping right in the lap? That seems a little forward, doesn't it? So right now, you only have a minute and 30 seconds left to place your bids. We're at $2,000 with Jim Johnson. This is your chance to rest and relief, refreshing relaxation and rejuvenation as you regale and rejoice in a remarkable rendition of refined recreation and table the task of tarnation and trauma and get away from the trouble and tyranny of traffic and trouncing tangles of tension and trepidation. But treat yourself with a trip of timeless tranquility and alleviation. Who loves their spouse more? This is what we're going to find out tonight. So hurry up and place your bids. It's a wonderful cause. It's a great way to buy your way into heaven. Place your bids now. The auction and is starting. And this is what I do by drum roll right. because that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So That's awesome. <laughs> I am in great shape from the neck up. Can't say that about the rest, but... Yeah. Well, as we're coming to a end of this conversation, I mean, it could just go on and on. We're not Joe Rogan talking to Elon Musk. We can't talk for three and a half. Hours. Exactly. No, we cannot. I mean, we could, but I don't think that will go very well with our no, well, online audience. This is, I hope this is the first of many because I love just, you know, sharing what I've experienced and you have too. And thank you for the platform because I hope it's very educational for the people who are listening. I found this market in the Boise and general Idaho area to be relatively underserved. No offense to the people that are still here. It's just commercial auctioneering and virtual events are two totally different jobs. Mm -hmm. And I don't even see auctioneering as, as a title in the virtual realm. And it's not like the weatherman can come in and consult and know how to produce one of these events. And they have a role in this. They certainly can. I mean, I've seen some amazing MCing coming, yeah. you know, out of uh, those professionals that have been in front of cameras for, for years, for sure. But what I, you know, I think what we're trying to get here is, Zach, you come with a complete package. And I honestly wish you all uh, the success here in this market, because there's a lot of opportunity. And I feel like there's so many nonprofits that could use your help and support in elevating their event, you know, may that be virtual or hybrid or in person in 2021. So looking forward to coming along for the ride and making events happen in 2021 because you know 2020 was a ride for sure but everyone that's been doing virtual events they come with the experience but they also come with the desire to take it to the next level yes. and how we do that is so important because there's a lot of tools out there there's a lot of information by now with what makes a successful virtual event and my goal with this podcast and the platform is really to give all that information make it available to anyone that's listening really and and know that they can be supported even when they feel like this is a task that feels very overwhelming because it's so different right. than what they're used to. Yeah, you you hit the nail right on the head. That wonderful collaboration. It's a much more collaborative spirit uh, that, that these virtual events are taking on. And that's a good thing. Yeah, I 
firmly believe in that. So tell me and tell our audience really, where can they find you online, on social media, on your website? Sure. Uh, Right now, uh, I'm really excited that the Idaho Benefit Events should be live, should be going live. IdahoBenefitEvents.com should be live by early March. For right now, though, I don't want to be too presumptuous. California Coast Auctions is the name of my company. You can either go to Zach Crone, Z-A-C-K-K-R-O-N-E, dot com and be taken to that site or or ca coast auctions i came to this boise market because this was a warm people and these are this is an incredible area and i'm so honored to be welcomed into this community as i've been coming here for years doing fundraisers i knew that this was going to be my new home even before covid we were planning it and so it's absolutely lovely so instagram uh zach crone underscore auctioneer and you know there's all over social media but instagram is usually where it's at well i will have those links in uh, the episode's notes for anyone that wants to check you out and and i mean who wouldn't want to do that (laughs) all the ladies out there not just kidding zach is married happily married with two beautiful children so stay away from him i'm just doing your wife a favor zach Hey, you know, this is a visual medium, whether on stage or on camera. You got like like to right? like what you're looking at. You that's know, right. I mean, I had to do my hair because normally that's not, this is not happening on the side of my face when I do Zoom <laughs> meetings. <laughs> you know, it, it's pretty funny because I'll tell you a little story before we go. I don't know if it's. Yeah, true. no, when go ahead. Working, when I was working for Reuters News, I was assigned to the entertainment division. And, you know, you start by you know, getting coffee and wrapping cable. And then you eventually work your way up to editing and then producing. And then you're writing the segment for the reporter. And then all of a sudden you become the reporter. And by the time I came the reporter, I'm there at the red carpet on all these movie premieres. The men never wanted to talk to me (laughs) because I'm six foot three. Well, I'm so much taller than they were that the men would just look at me and go, I don't want to be on camera with this guy. Makes them look small. The (laughs) ladies loved standing next to me because it made them look taller. And so like the Nicole Kidmans and the Sandra Bullocks, they're tall women, but I'm still a little taller than them. So they're going for that. The problem was I always had to, you know, their their handlers, their publicists, their managers say, make sure you mention the necklace, make sure you mention the dress. And I was like, no, I want to ask them about the movie and the art that they practice. You know, they're not a mannequin. And so I was like, yeah, I'm ready to get out of this. And that's how I got into this business to begin with. I don't, I'm sorry. I know you're trying to wrap it's it up. A, no, it's a tough word out there. No, I know what you mean. started as an MC, and I kept yeah. seeing the same problem at these live events. I was asked as a news person the way a weatherman or a sports anchor is asked to do these virtual events or live events. And I kept seeing the same problem, which was a commercial auctioneer who sells cars, couches, and cattle being brought up onto the stage. And they're great at what they do. They're great at liquidating assets and selling to a room full of professional bidders and staying one step ahead of bidders with that really fast chant. But that's not the applicable job at the live virtual fundraising world. It's about taking yeah. them for a ride with you and not intimidating them or scaring them. It's holding their hand and making them laugh. I fell into it and I'm really happy that I did because it brings me such joy. I can't see myself doing anything else. Well, I'm so excited that you share from your passion, from your knowledge, from all the wealth of experience that you've acquired over you know years of doing events and all type of events, really. It was an honor to have you, Zach. I'm so happy that we got to do this. And I know our schedules have been a little crazy. Anyone that works in virtual events right now, I feel like they've got some crazy schedule going on. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you, Anka. You're the best. <laughs>